उम्मीदों को अपने मिले पंग हजार शिक्षा के सपने हुए साकार कैनरा एजुकेशन लो कैनरा बाइक टुगेदर वी कैन रोज है सजता विकास का त्योहार गौरव से है बढ़ता अब हर व्यापार कैनरा एम एस बी लोन कैनरा बैंक टुगेदर वी कैन रोज है सजता विकास का त्योहार गौरव से है बढ़ता अब हर व्यापार कैनरा एम एस बी लोन कैनरा बैंक टुगेदर वी कैन
रोज है सजता विकास का त्योहार गौरव से है बढ़ता अब हर व्यापार कैनरा एम एस एम लोन कैनरा बैंक टूगेदर वी कैन I recently read the book Lean Startup by author Eric Ries. In 2004, Eric Ries was the chief technology officer of a Silicon Valley startup called IMVU. IMVU's vision was to create a new online product that would allow users to build 3D avatars and interact with friends using their existing instant messaging networks. Their product would combine two popular trends at the time: 3D gaming and instant messaging. With complete confidence in their new business product, they got to work, putting in crazy hours to bring their idea to life. After 6 months, Eric and his team had incorporated all the major instant messaging services like AOL and MSN Messenger into the product, and it was finally ready to be released. On launch day, they eagerly awaited the th- Hello everyone good evening and a warm welcome to one and all present here it's an honor itself to honor this beautiful audience who are here i nayan saluja welcome you all on the behalf of entrepreneurship cell iit kharagpur thank you all for your prize time entrepreneurship cell awareness drive local startup meet is an initiative where we connect startups and investors it helps to raise funds networking with industry experts renowned entrepreneurs and corporate individuals We had started our event with an opening ceremony of fourth on fourth of November. Carrying forward the momentum, we proudly present the first workshop on lean startup drive as a part of LFCF 2020. Whenever we are doing anything new, whether it's a startup or a large company, there is this high level of uncertainty. Getting into execution mode mode is often the wrong mindset because we often don't know what we don't know. The lean approach really starts off by saying that everything we know about what the business is or what it's going to become is really a guess. So we have to take a more empirical approach and lay out our critical assumptions, prioritize them from high risk to low, low risk and then systematically tackle them. That's lean in a nutshell. So before we start let me acknowledge the presence of an eminent guest Mr. Vidhar Anderson, founding principal of Plus Anderson and Associates. Mr Vidar has been recognized as one of the most important person in German startup pe- in gen- German startup scene. So now I would like to uh now I would like Mr Vidar and the scene to begin begin the session. Well, thank you so much for introducing me and thank you so much for having me. Um I'm uh very excited to be able to share a little bit about um the lean startup methodology and uh, i hope i can be as little theoretical as possible and try to break it down on how it actually applies to actually founding a startup uh before we uh proceed uh, maybe i should talk a little bit about myself and uh why on earth i might have something to say about these things well first and foremost i'm a startup founder myself um since the mid 90s i've been founding stuff with technology uh, mainly internet mobile web technology um also because i have received a lot of help uh, on the way and also because i had to learn a lot of the things the hard way i have also become obsessed with sort of passing on my knowledge to other people especially young first time founders so they can avoid my stupid mistakes and do their own stupid mistakes um so i've been around the world from stanford to the largest uh university uh, private technical universities in iran to uh Switzerland to uh, god knows where uh trying to sort of impress upon young students um a more scientific a more sort of painless way of an of basically also faster way of doing uh, a startup um so um 
because I also need to, uh, to earn money at some point, I also have a company that work with some of the largest corporations in the world. Um, we do innovation advising and we help large companies get serious about innovation. And that means just basically delivering results instead of fancy PowerPoints. Uh, if you want to know more about me than even possibly my mother wants to know about me, you can also um, go to, uh, let's see, we have it here, vitoranderson.com. And uh, there's plenty more information about me than you probably want to ever know. So some of the stuff that I have founded in my time is the following. Uh, let's see, we have here the Plown uh, Content Management System. Some of you might have heard about it. It's uh, super old and co-founder uh, was founded, I think, 2000, 2001. Um, my company, plusanderson.com, and also one of the first social local mobile apps was called Gauss, the people magnet. Also, some of the features, um, some of the places my work has been features, I've been around from the New York Times to CNN to TechCrunch to whatever, so all around the world. And... Um, also, like I said, I'm an educator and some of the uh, educational uh, institutions that I already talked about are here, our uh, largest uh, technical university even in Iran, um, the University of Cologne, Cologne Business School, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, so on and so forth. Also been involved with uh, USAID to help uh, inspire entrepreneurship around, especially in Eastern European cit um, cities and uh, countries. And also, I am a Lean Launchpad a certified educator trained by Steve Blank at Stanford, um, which is quite helpful for me because I have the typical entrepreneurship background of being a university dropout. So being sort of officially blessed by the grandfather of the Lean Startup movement, if you will, uh, has helped me to be able to teach at um, these universities. And here we have a picture of me uh, teaching under the auspice of two ayatollahs in the uh, university in Iran. Also, I am a startup founder, like I said, not just a teacher or an advisor. Um, also, I've been pitching a lot of investors, a lot of press with my startups. And also, I am the co-founder of the largest pitching event in Germany. And I have been personally training over 1,000 startups how to pitch so far. Also, some of my corporate customers with my company, Plus Anderson Associates. Not so exciting for you startup people, but for your corporate people out there, there are names like Telecom, Telefonica, Philip Morris, Bertelsmann, Henkel, international names that you probably already know. Now. Let's get to it. Let's talk about the lean startup. Now, the, I could be talking here for ages. And usually when I uh, talk about lean startup or introduce especially students to lean startup, I think the, the least amount of time you need to really, really get in depth here is about three days. <laughs> and we now have maybe a little bit over an hour. And also, I want to position this um, so that we have enough time to take your questions, because I think that's also probably a very um, good investment uh, in your time that we actually also just don't spend all of the time listening to me going blah, blah, blah. And also, I want to really hear about your questions and where you're at with your startups when I am finished. Because like I said, I, I could be talking for three days on end on this. It is a rather complex matter if you want to get very theoret theoretical about it, but we're startup founders, so we'll try to keep it as pragmatic and easy as possible. Now, let's see here. What is the uh, Lean Startup? The Lean Startup is basically three things. So it's business model generation made famous by Alexander Osterwalder. It's customer development by Steve Blank. And it's agile engineering and MVP and innovation accounting, basically innovation metrics, if you will, um, which was all sort of... Um, um, causally linked, if you will, for Steve Blank being the um, teacher of Eric Ries. Now, um, if you're doing just one of these things or two of these things, you're not doing the Lean Startup properly. So that's like a big, big thing up front. You need to know what these three things are and what the essence at least are of these things that comprises what we call the Lean Startup. Now, um, 
I'll try to break it down to you guys as easy as possible, at least to give you a basic overview. Now, usually, like I said, we would be talking about this and doing workshops about all the subject matters for about three days on end, but we have limited time today. So I would recommend you guys, and I'll be happy to provide the uh, slides for this presentation for you guys later. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah, there we go. I will go away here. Now, you should read this book by Steve Blank. It's super great as a reference. This as well, the Startup Owner's Manual and Strategy Guide. Like I said, you don't have to make notice right now or take note right now. I will make it available after the presentation. And also, here's an inside secret tip. You can get the Lean Launchpad curriculum for free the curriculum from Stanford and Berkeley, you can get it for free if you go on Udacity here and using this link. So uh, I'll leave that into the presentation. Now, before we start about talking about Lean Startup, it should be also probably very helpful to talk about how do we got here? What do we know now? What is sort of the, uh, the, the state of the knowledge we have about founding a company? Well, actually, companies are, as, the, as we know it, they're not that old. They all started in 1602, I think it was, with the East India Company. It was the first incorporated company. And uh, over 300 years since then, we had a lot of knowledge that was aggregating about how to run a business, about administrating a business. And lo and behold, in 1908, the first MBA was born at Harvard. That is the Master of Business Association. A lot of clever people thought, well, we know so much about how to manage a business right now. We can make a degree out of it. We can educate people how it is actually to run a company, m uh, manage and administer, if you will, a running company. Now, let's fast forward here to today. Now we have... Uh, over the last century, also gathered, let's say, after the Second World War, after maybe the, the 50s, the 60s, and, and so forth, we have been gathering a lot of knowledge about how it is to manage a modern business, how it is also to, to use tools, all sorts of things have been institutionalized, rationalized, optimized, about how to run and manage an existing business. Now, what we figured out already is that this is a big thing. Startups are not a copy of an existing company. There's a different kind of beast, if you will. There's a different kind of company, which is called a startup. And for some reason, my slides are now going in and out. I'm trying to get them to show here. Just a second. Hmm. For some reason, they don't want to show. Okay. There they go. Okay. So what we don't know is that startups are not just smaller versions of large companies. And this was one of the big, big insights of Steve Blank. He has himself, I think, uh, had successfully exited eight technology companies. And he was sort of wondering about and thinking a lot about what is it about startups that make them different from, let's say, running a PepsiCo or Coca-Cola? What is it that makes startups very different from, let's say, a government? What is it that makes it very different from what we know about how to administer and manage companies? Because what he recognized is that all the information that we already had that was about managing and administrating companies, they were basically missing a whole bunch of information about what about starting the tools? What the tools do we need to start? What about starting new companies? That uh, thing that you probably heard from founder Peter, uh, uh, Peter Thiel about how to get from zero to one, from nothing to something, right? 
all the education that we've had so far, like in the 20th century and partially also in the 21st century in universities particularly, is about how to manage and run something that's already existing. Now, startups are in that little space there where you go from nothing to something to try to build an existing running company, right? So what we needed was new information, new tools, new methodologies about how to start new companies. And for that, the big insight was also all the information that we already had about how to run existing companies wouldn't work for running a startup and doing a startup. So the first insight was a startup is not a smaller version of an existing company. It's a different kind of organization altogether. Now, on the other hand, a company is a permanent organization, right? An existing a company that you can administer and you can do it, um, um, so you can run if you have an MBA, let's say, is a permanent organization that is designed to execute a repeatable and scalable business model. That is to say, the business model is proven and it's operating in a relative predictable and stable environment. That is to say, what we did yesterday is probably what we're going to be doing next week and maybe what we've been doing for the last 50 years. Now, the big insight from Steve Blank was that the startup is a temporary organization. Why is it temporary? Well, you want to become a large company. So you don't want to be a startup forever because it sucks. Every day is different. You have an immense amount of insecurity and you don't cannot predict anything. And most of us, we go bankrupt before we actually manage to build a big company out of it. I don't know if you know, uh, but um, I think internationally, even the success rate of a startup is probably less than 10%. So basically, this is also a, a big warning to you guys. If you think founding a startup is a way to make easy and fast money, you're way mistaken. So it's a big advice here. If you want to do a startup, on one hand, it's probably the most interesting learning experience you'll ever have. And if you're successful, it's probably going to be the most fruitful. Now, also be aware that it's a super high risk venture. 90% of all startups fail. So if you want to be successful in life, guaranteed and have a good uh, sort of a if you have, want to have enough money to do uh, well by, you should probably listen to your parents and finish your degree and not drop out like me and maybe get a good job. Now, that said, for you guys who still want to venture it, who still wants to risk it, let's delve into it again. Now, a startup is a temporary organization, right? Because we're working to get to a large company. And this can take a lot of time. I'll get back to that. Now, it's designed to and optimized to search for uh, a, a sort of a repeatable and scalable business model. Search, that is to say, we don't know even yet day one, most of the time, what the business model will be. We don't know if it will scale. A big, big uh, sort of um, adage, if you will, uh, advice from, I think it was Chris, Chris Dixon, one of the founders of Flickr, he said, do the things that don't scale. So basically, we're now trying to find an existing or search for a business model, and then we need to test if it can actually be um, scalable later and repeatable later. Now, and we're operating in an environment of extreme uncertainty. I'll get back to what that means. That means that every day you come into the office, you're probably going to be do so, doing something else. Maybe every day you need to ask yourself, are we doing the right thing? And maybe you need to pivot. Maybe you need to do something completely different. We'll see, we'll see what that means. Now, that was quite theoretical. Let's break it down. Um, so it used to be we had for strategy, we had an operating plan and we had a financial model and we were doing like what we call business plans, right? Now, we know that no plan survives first contact with the markets, with customers, right? So doing a startup could be like on Monday, you um, are thinking that you probably will never be successful. Then on Tuesday, maybe a big tech blog publishes a, a glowing review of your product and then you're super happy and you think everything is going to be great. Then the server breaks on Wednesday and then on Thursday, you uh, 
probably get it back up again. And then maybe come Sunday, you sell for a million dollars. It's like a complete roller coaster. That also means it may not be for everybody because the highs are very high and the lows are very low. And the degree of uncertainty, even between days, can be very high. Now, what we also know now is that the previous strategy for doing this with a five-year plan, the so-called business plan, right? The only people we knew that had been doing economic plans for five years before were actually the communist bloc, right? USSR, for instance, Soviet Russia. Now, we know how that turned out for them. But the weirdest thing is that for over 80 years, and some universities still, are teaching entrepreneurs that they should do plans like communist Russia about economy and business. We know now that that's insane. That cannot work because we're operating with an immense amount of in, uh, with uncertainty and we have absolutely no data day one to base a five-year-old, a uh, five-year plan on. What we know today is that the planning comes before the business plan. What does that mean? Well, we mean for strategy, we know have something that is called the business model canvas. Well, instead of a business plan, the business model canvas actually will show you on one piece of paper or one digital page, if you will, what we previously would have to sort of put into a lot of blah, 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 into maybe 80 pages in a document of trying to explain a business model. It's a super simplified version of maybe up to 80 pages of blah, blah, which is the basis for me as a founder to share to the world how I've been thinking about how this could work as a business, realistically. And it also serves as a tool for me to communicate with my investors, with my team. Where are we today? So that is to say, how much of this have we already proven? of my belief. So basically what this is, it's a map of your belief mapped onto the, the, the elements that you need to have a successful business model. So basically it helps us organize our thinking as entrepreneurs, and it helps us also to keep ourselves real where we identify this is something we believe in, and this is a fact because we have data. So what we know where we don't know this yet because it's just a belief, we can identify that oh, this might be critical, we need to go and test it. So it also helps you to identify where we, um, we say in the lean uh, sort of speak, where you have to go out of the building. And with going out of the building, we basically mean that you need to start talking to customers, talking to users, going out in the market, doing tests to validate your beliefs. Because inside of the office, and this is a big, big, big point that also start um, that uh, lean, um, lean startup grandfather, if you will, um, Steve Blank identified. Inside of your office, there are only beliefs. And all the facts that will make you successful are out there in the market. So you need not only sort of physically to go out of your office and speak to the market. You also need to get out of that comfort zone because all of the time, all of the time I see founders and let's take a sort of a digression on this one. I usually say, see about 2000, 3000 founders a year. And one trend that I see is that there's either the artist or there's the entrepreneur. And sometimes people are a little bit confused if they're one or the other. Now, the artists are the kind of person that thinks they're Steve Jobs and they think that I know exactly what the market needs. I know exactly what I'm going to build. Although the market tells them, we don't want it, we don't need it, and you need to change this, but we'll buy that. They will still try to force it onto the market. Now, the entrepreneur, on the other hand, the entrepreneurial-minded person will go when they say, when the customers say, nah, I can't buy that. And I will say, so, so what are you looking for? 
And then it's like, why can't you buy that? They're listening. And then maybe the customer says, well, you know, um, the um, billing, uh, the monthly billing plan is not something that we can uh, can do. And then it's like, well, did I tell you already? The entrepreneur will start think and think about how can I sell this? And then there was asked, well, maybe if we could do this as a yearly plan, is that like a one-time payment? Is that something that you'd be more comfortable with or your company will be able to pay? And they'll go, yeah, of course. Why didn't you say that you were offering that? So, so basically, if you want to be successful, you have to listen to the market. Listen to your customers. If you want to be an artist, don't get into business. Um, now, let's see how the Lean Startup actually helps you with a framework for listening to your customers. So to sum this up, we have seen that before we had for um, strategy, we have business model hypothesis, which is to say fancy ass worth for saying we have beliefs about how the business could work. And then what we want is to validate as much as we possibly can so that we are able to actually grow a business, have an operating plan, and do financial forecasts when we have actual users and customers and revenue to actually make financial forecasts with. So the financial forecast and the operating plan, they're not out of the window. We know now that what we do need before we get to that point is to validate and test if the business model, the, the whole thing, that we, the business that we're trying to build, is it actually going to work? We need to get out of the building. We need to talk to customers. We need to validate our beliefs. And it bears repeating. Everybody say it with me. <laughs> a startup is a temporary organizational form, right? We don't want to be a startup forever. It sucks. Uh, we want to be a big company, make big money. And the way we do that as fast as possible, instead of failing flat on our faces, is getting out of the building to search for repeatable and scalable business model. Because we know that it's extremely uncertain, day one, if this is going to work or not. So let's talk about processes because it used to be, and maybe if you've been studying business already in school, this is something you've been teach, uh, taught about. So we to manage the processes, usually we were doing product management, project management, and waterfall engineering. You've probably seen a couple of beautiful Gantt diagrams and how everything is supposed to be working. Now, it also used to be that first you did a concept, then we did the development, then we did some testing, then we had a great launch party, and then maybe it worked, and most likely it really didn't work. After the funding, uh, the amount of money ran out, uh, many, many, many companies fell flat on their faces, especially during the dot-com boom of the early or like late 90s, early uh, 2000s. One of the reasons was that they were actually building a lot of things that people couldn't already consume. Because a lot of these businesses actually uh, were uh, dependent on a large market of people who could consume, buy, purchase on the internet. And they hadn't really done the job to test if the market was already able and willing to spend their money online. Which they found out the hard way by burning a lot of billions of investor money that no, the market wasn't ready yet. So. Let's go back to what we used to do. Now, we know now that we should probably not do development of a startup in this very linear fashion, right? Because what happens here is that if you first do a concept, then we do some development, and what we do some testing, and then we do the launch, what is missing is input from the customer and the market, right? We are not going to do this linear waterfall engineering model for a startup. It's a surefire way of building something that will not be successful because you are operating in the dark. You're operating in a vacuum. 
you have in this model zero input from the customer and the market. So what we used to do is, here we see it in a basic Gantt diagram. We are not going to use this kind of waterfall engineering, waterfall planning for a startup. Well, there's a caveat to that, of course, like there is to most things. Um, these um, kinds of project management um, man um, strategies and methodologies are still valid, but only, only if you know the customer problem, only if you already know the uh, product features. So we're going to do something else instead. Now, that said, I already told you that most startups, they fail. And the reason why they fail is one, they, uh, the founders don't really see the world in the same way anymore and they don't get along for some reason. That's a big, a big, big uh, reason. And I think the second biggest reason is that most startups fail because they cannot find enough customers to sustain it as a business. Because, well, let's frankly be honest, they're building something that the market doesn't want. Or at least maybe not enough people in the market want. So it used to be that we had at least some ways, some ways that we were teaching people how to manage engineering risk, right? Now, this is great if you know the problem you're solving, if you know the customer's pains and gains, if you know what is supposed to be built and you can validate it with data already. Now, we know then that engineering or technology today is not your biggest risk. Most startups do not fail because they fail to build a technology. Given enough time and resources today, you can build anything, right? So um, the biggest risk, we already saw it, right? The biggest risk is customer risk. The biggest risk that you have when you're trying to build a startup is that, will this be something that you can repeatedly sell and scale? Is there enough market? Is there enough demand? Are you building something that people care about? Now, here we have the process that Steve Blank uh, introduced and he called it customer development. Now, customer development is a very fancy term. Um, let me try to break it down like I think of it. So, customer development is about co-creating, co-developing the product or solution that you're trying to build from day one. And there's two parts that are super duper important. And they're probably the two parts that we will be concentrating the most on when we're talking about Lean Startup. Because as we see here, there are two boxes. We see the box here that says uh, search on the left-hand side. And we see there's a box called execution on the right-hand side. So in the middle there, between the two boxes, that's sort of the transition phase where you're going from a successful startup to successfully building a large company. And the most startups, especially early stage startups, are only concerned with the part in the left, which is called search. So what it starts with here, it says customer discovery. And we'll be talking in length uh, later about what this means because it's a little bit abstract at the moment. Customer discovery really has two, um, two um, tests that you need to introduce. Like I said, you probably have a lot of beliefs about your business a lot of beliefs that still has not yet to be tested. And what we do, we already talked about it, is we get out of the office and we talk to our customers because the first thing we want to know, and that's inside of the customer discovery, the sort of tennis ball, if you will, <laughs> the most to the left, is, is, this is there a problem or need? Is there indeed a problem or need in the space that I want to be building a startup? So we're going to not be selling anything. We're not going to be trying to pitch anything. We're not even building anything. We're going out to the kinds of people that we think would be interested in the solution because they have a, pay, pr uh, a problem or a need. And we're going to talk to them to try to identify, is that true? Is our belief that these people have a problem or need really true? And then... 
if and only if we can find enough people that indeed feeds back to us that they have a problem or need in that space, then we don't go back to the office. We don't sort of hunker down and start developing, developing, developing. No, we have to go out there again to those people who identify they have a problem or need. And we're going to co-create our hypothetical solution, our hypothetical product with as least uh, amount of effort as possible. Even paper will do at this point and try to figure out if the solution that we have in mind is in fact the solution that they can work with, that works for them. And most of the time I see people doing lean startup only like half of the time, right? They go like, okay, so we talk to people and we, we, we discovered, um, yeah, it is indeed here a market and okay, yeah, this is in fact something that we uh, believe is a product. Now, what they forget is they forget that your idea of a product, product or solution may not be what your customer, your user can actually work with or even buy. So what we need to do as fast as possible is go back to the people who has the problem or need and present the solution. Not selling, no selling allowed ever in this phase, if you will, in this, um, let's see, the, the leftmost, the first starting point of the tennis ball on the left-hand side in the customer discovery phase, no selling at all. We're trying to learn. We're trying to validate. We're trying to figure out if and only if we have figured out that there is indeed a problem or need, and it's a big problem or need, then we're going to try to figure out is our idea of the product really the product that would work for the customer or the user, right? So we're going to get into more detail because this is probably the most important part of Lean Startup, at least the way I see it. Now, also, we have something uh, we uh, had... Um, which has been sort of adapted and co-opted also for the uh, Lean Startup methodology, which is called Agile Development, iterative um, um, uh, development instead of like large processes, large, long uh, processes with uh, waterfall development. We're now trying to get something out there as soon as possible. And this is also why we start with a paper or a PowerPoint or something super like a mock-up or click dummy, or anything as fast as possible, and then we iterate. We iterate and iterate. We don't wait, 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 and build something super complex and then ship it, and then maybe uh, half of it or more is not needed. We are going to iterate, and we are going to be sort of shipping out one feature at a time, not building the whole thing day one. This is a super, in, uh, super important concept, right? We're not going to start building especially if you're building a digital product, we're not going to be feature complete. That would be crazy. Speed is of the essence for a startup. By the time we'd be finished to build all the features without actually having talked to customers, we would have been wasting so much time, so much effort, so much motivation, only to figure out it doesn't work or it's not what they want or can use. So we want to avoid that. So we want to be as fast as possible in trying to validate, trying to learn is this something that could work or not? And if it couldn't work, what would work instead? So to sum it up, for the process of creating a startup, we're now using customer development and agile development. And most of the time, we are going to be talking about the search box, the execution box. I call it, well, you should be so lucky. That means that you're already um, uh, sort of advanced from being a scrappy startup and you've done everything right and you're now building a large successful company. And that's not what we're going to be concentrating on today. Now, also, it's an important thing to keep in mind. We're not throwing all the other old ways of um, doing method, like the old methodologies of doing project management, product management out of the window. No, what we're saying is that it comes later. It comes when you have created something that the market repeatedly wants to buy. Then you have data, you have validated your business model, and you can start doing iterations on a product. You can start building a company with processes that uses product management and also waterfall development. But that comes so much later. 
Right. Now, when it comes to organization, right? A lot of people、um, think that a startup is a very sort of complex、uh, um, organization. It isn't. It's usually three people, and、uh, everything is mostly flat.、Um, so we had in, let's say, if you're doing a business uh, um, um, degree or business、uh, study. We talk about organizational structures, and there's departments, and it's your responsibilities, and that's not my responsibility, and so on and so forth. Now, in a startup, you're responsible for everything, <laughs> especially if you're the idea person, the int,、uh, the the the、uh, what you call it, the、um, initiator of the startup. You're responsible for all of it, and there's no department for this, a department for that. You're just trying to get by. You're just trying to make things happen. And you can't just outsource this and outsource that. You're responsible. So what we know now is that to be successful as a startup, we don't do a lot of organizational structure and hire a lot of people, maybe with investors' money. No, we are not doing sales. We're not doing marketing. We're not doing business development in the beginning. We're getting out of the building, mentally and physically, out of the building. Talking to customers to figure out if this is a viable business, if and only if we figure it out is a viable business because we have data to prove it, because we've actually talked to people, then only then do we proceed to the next, which is we build a product together, iteratively, with the customer. Because one of the reasons why we do this. Is the people that you'd hire for these roles, right? These are not the people that would actually be comfortable with that kind of uncertainty and unclear rules and responsibility to be doing everything. So, who you want to be sort of working with in a small startup day one are probably very different kind of people. That you would be hiring when you're growing into a large, successful company. So now we know that entrepreneurial execution,、uh, sorry, and <laughs> entrepreneurial education was all about execution. That is to say, how do we operate what is already existing? And for something that's already existing, we could use a business plan. A PowerPoint presentation, if you will, do business research, market analysis, analysis, and so on and so forth. But for entrepreneurial education for startups, it's all about search. So for a startup, if you already learned about business plans and doing market analysis and blah 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 blah, we can throw it out of the window for now. I don't know who needs to hear this, but. Business plans, you don't need it. You do not need it if you're a startup. And here, I think I should also take a moment to clarify, because there seems to be some confusion often about what is a startup. A startup is usually,、uh, especially in the context of the lean startup, is something that is hyper scalable. That means it's not a what people call. And I think it's a bit derogatory because I, I really do enjoy all kinds of entrepreneurship. But people call some kind of entrepreneurship lifestyle businesses, which I think is also awesome as long as you can support yourself and your family and your community.、Um, it doesn't have to be the next Facebook. But what we're talking about here in the context of lean startup, it's usually something that is potentially hyperscalable, which also means that it is a、um, probably in large part a digital solution or product. Now that said. Business plans for that purposes, when the business model is completely new, is you can throw it out the window because is is not needed. Now, what you should keep in mind is if you're trying to build a retail business, a server provider business,、uh, a business, let's say a kiosk, a, a retail store, something that's been already been existing for many, many, many years, maybe hundreds of years, that the business model is completely known. And the ins and outs are usually scaling with goods and/or people. Then, by all means, you should still do a business plan. So, what I'm saying here is that business plans for the kind of startups that you'll see in Silicon Valley, for instance, then business plans are really not、uh, very helpful because 
basically they're projecting about business models that you already you don't really know if they're going to be successful or if they can work or not. But if you're building a business based on an existing proven, maybe even old business model, then you still need to be uh, doing a business plan because most likely at some point you also need to open a line of credit or go to a bank and the bank will definitely need to see a business plan. On the other hand, if you're building a hyperscalable product and if you want to talk to an investor about financing, the good investor, the startup investor will not be able to work with a business plan. They will basically delete your business plan because it's not what they want to see for you to get funded. Now, that said, let's do a summary and move on. So it used to be that we had for strategy, process, organization, education of founders and entrepreneurs, we um, talked about how it went and only about for over 80 years in universities even, and still in some universities today, we only talked about how to operate something that was already existing. And that led to a lot of failures in new business because it didn't really apply to creating new businesses. So what we know today is that we are now, if we're a startup, we're most likely searching for a scalable and repeatable business model, which means that we need other methodologies, other tools than what we need for our administrating and managing an existing company. And we know that we should be using business model hypothesis, which is basically what we talked about, a business model canvas to um, show ourselves what our beliefs are and where the facts are, and then identify where the beliefs are that are critical. We need to go and test them and make them sort of into facts if we can. And we're going to be using the customer development and agile development process. For organization, we need customer development teams, which are basically only comprised of the founders of the company. And to teach um, the educational part, we now need to teach the business model design, customer development, startup team building, entrepreneurial finance, and agile development, and data-driven marketing. Now, I also said um, there's a transition time, right, between being a scalable startup and a large company. So I think this is sort of something that we lose out of sight at some point. Most companies, not every, if not every, at some point they were a startup, right? You don't get big overnight. It's a large, large transition phase over time. Right. Now I see, uh, I wanted to go into detail about um, some misconceptions about the uh, customer development part. Here, we are now talking about getting out of the building again, right? So number one here, after we have thrown out our, or sort of um, had a brainstorm, if you will, about the um, most important things, our beliefs and the facts, if we have on the business model canvas, you know, we put it on post-its on the business model canvas. Why do we put it on post-its? Well, we can then easily remove them if we find out that it's not relevant or they're not really true, if they're beliefs that we cannot turn into facts, right? So um, it also helps us um, basically to fire our hypotheses, fire our uh, guesses before we get fired ourselves by an investor. It used to be that the investor would probably fire you because you couldn't make a successful startup. Today, we're allowed to fire our hypotheses, fire our business model before we fail. Because we know today, the sooner we start learning, the sooner we start finding the facts, the more time we have to build a successful company. So we start with a brainstorm to get all the ideas out that we have about how the business model can work, what we need to deliver, to whom. And then um, when we see that there, oh, there's some critical things in there that we don't know yet if they're facts, then we need to go out of the building and start talking to customers. And we're going to be escalating to designing experiments, running tests. But usually we start with basically talking to people, talking to customers. And like I said, this tennis ball chart is... Um, where um, the search is on the left-hand side is usually where we're going to be doing all of the work in the early days. And I said, there are two steps 
to the customer discovery. Usually, we're just assuming, and this is a big, big thing, we're just assuming that our idea is a good one, right? So I think, and this is a big, big point. I think if you want to be successful, it's very important that you keep in mind that you might be wrong. But if you're doing it iteratively, and if you're doing this more like an experiment, a scientific experiment, you know that you will have time to change things along the way to make you more successful, to adapt the problem uh, to the to the problem or solution that you might find on the way when you're talking to real customers, you're talking to real uh, um, people. Now, a lot of the time, and this is why I think it's so important, I see people who are just sort of fixated on their ideas. And and I don't know who needs to hear it, but um, your idea is probably not correct. <laughs> and the more you sort of keep clinging to your idea and not keeping an open mindset, uh, more approaching this as a scientific experiment to try to prove or disprove if this is actually a, an idea that will be successful in the marketplace, the more you're setting yourself up to failure. So if there's anything you should be taking away from today is like, think about your startup idea as a scientific experiment and proceed from there. Now, I wanted to break this down in a more realistic sort of or pragmatic uh, uh, version because this tennis ball uh, chart is... Um, a little bit complex. Let's make it super duper simple. Customer development basically says there are five tests. Test number one, which we start with, is to try to validate, is this a problem? Is this really a need? Once we have this, and this is also a caveat, a lot of startups are founded by people who are domain experts in what they're trying to solve. That means that if you are an experienced professional or you're an experienced in, in the problem or you're an experienced person in the problem or need already, and you've seen people basically suffering from this problem or need um, all over the place, then maybe, just maybe, you need to skip this. But a lot of us, we start with nothing and we have a brilliant idea, oh, as long as we think we have a brilliant idea, and then we need to start test if this is indeed a problem or need that the world really cares about. Now, number two, test number two is once we've established the fact, and as a fact, not like fooling ourselves, um, that this is indeed a problem or need worth solving, then we're going to test, is this indeed the solution that we thought would actually work, right? We're going to not assume just because we know it's a problem or need that we also know what the solution is. No, customer development means we're co-developing with the customer from day one. So we're going as soon as possible back to the people that has a problem or need and we're going to develop with a prototype, with even pen and paper, if you will, to develop the, uh, the solution that they can work with together with them. Now, test number three, and I say this is you should be so lucky because you've already done a lot of hard work if you get to, to test three, is can we sell? Can we repeatedly sell? Can we sell the solution that we have now developed with those customers or users? Can we keep on selling it? Or if you're doing something, let's say, in B2B that is uh, not in sales, um, can we keep on growing? Can we get more users? Can we get more users in? That's your test number three. If and only if you can be successful in all of these tests, we get to test four, which is basically, can we repeat selling the solution and become a large company? And can we scale our business and build out our company? Now, what we usually see is the process here from getting from, I have nothing to, okay, can we start uh, repeat selling the solution? That is to say, where we get to a product market fit that usually can take about two years. 
And that's a big point. You could be lucky. You could be doing something that could get your product market fit much faster. But a lot of the time, we start with just a hunch. Or we start with an idea. And then we learn a lot of things that makes us change along the way. And then it takes so much longer to make a successful startup than most people um, actually imagine. That's why I also said in the introduction here that if you want to make a uh, if you want to be a successful business person, don't do a startup. It's super risky and it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, and maybe you're going to be working in vain because 90% of startups fail. So you need to know that also if you're successful, I think the average time to an exit is somewhere between six to eight years. That is to say, most of the time, if you're successful, it's even going to take six to eight years if you're a venture-backed startup before you can cash out and be super successful. So these things take much more time. This is definitely not a way to get quick, quickly rich. Now, we can also try to um, visualize this even simpler, if you will. Maybe this is easier to remember. First, we need to discover something that people want, and we wanted to sort of prove that we can uh, um, prove that people want it. Then we need to make something that people want. Then we need to be able to market something that people want and sell it. And then we need to be able to scale our business. These are basically the phases of getting from zero to one, getting from a uh, basically an idea, or let's say uh, where we have. Um, a low level of evidence behind our assumptions to high level of facts because we already have something in the marketplace that is working and we can repeatedly sell it and we're selling it so successfully that we can scale our business. So basically, that's probably the easiest way I can possibly explain that there's like three phases, if you will, to the customer development, to building a successful startup out of an idea where you start with very low confidence in um, the idea and low, low level of evidence that it could actually work until a very high evidence that it actually works and then you're actually successful, which means that we have a first phase where everything is very chaotic because we're trying to search for that um, product or solution that will actually work. And then in the um, second phase, we're going to have some uh, other chaotic uh, issues because we're growing into a company. We're leaving, basically, the phase of being a startup. And then we have phase three, where we're absolutely not a startup anymore, and we're becoming, or we actually have become, a regular company. Now... You probably also saw some red dots on here. The red dots on this is basically a, um, um, what, can, what can I say? It's like a qualifier, if and only if. Now, sometimes you cannot find um, a problem or need. So what do we do? Do we, we talk about um, pivoting or persevering, right? So pivoting basically means that You've changed something in the business model. Something, you've fired maybe a hypothesis or two, or you have a new hypothesis that comes into the business model. That means that you have to start, of course, over again to test if that new hypothesis could actually be uh, correct. Now, this also means that um, you've done a pivot. So basically, there's a lot of confusion about what is a pivot and what does it mean to pivot? Well, a pivot is in the moment that you have changed something in the business model. Now, don't forget that you also need to validate what you changed, right? And another thing, you do not get to pivot <laughs> just because things get hard, right? I see, especially in, in young founders, it's like, so yeah, we talked about, I don't know, 20 people and now... Um, Every now, nah, I think we need to do something else. And then now, or I don't know, this is hard. Let's do something else. It's like pivot doesn't mean that you get a, get free out of jail card or get to sort of stop doing something that's easier just because things get hard, right? So a pivot is when you know that you cannot learn anything more. Or you learned um, like quantifiably that this cannot work or you've invalidated a hypothesis. 
doesn't mean that, oh, it just got hard. Now I want to do something else. So we made a pivot. No, <laughs> that does not. That's not what it means. Now, what is an iteration? Well, an iteration is just if you've uh, sort of refined something that you already have in a hypothesis or whatever you have on a, um, um, there. Um, so it, it means a variation of what was already an assumption in your or a fact in your business model. It um, doesn't change the business model in itself. So that's an iteration. It's often a discussion. And like I said, you don't get to pivot just because things get hard. Because, like I said, if you want to do a startup, it's probably the hardest thing, but the most sort of fruitful learning experience you're ever going to have. But it's the hardest thing you can ever do to be successful in business. Now, let's try to summarize. Here we go. Uh, here we go. There we go. Um, we're going to be testing your guesses, testing your hypotheses, and then we're going to look for insights, right? And this is what I meant by, are you the artist or are you the entrepreneur? Because the artist doesn't listen. So there's no insights, right? But if you're the, interpre if you're the entrepreneurial person, and maybe you've figured out that, hey, you know, that thing, that social network for young little dogs, puppies that I was building, there was no real market for it. But I talked to about 150 dog owners and, you know, there's like this, this, and this, and this, and I don't know, 10 other issues that we've learned as insights because we've been listening as problems or needs that these dog owners have that I can be building another business around, right? So it's all about also when you're testing your guesses and talking to uh, customers, all about listening, right? And it's about sort of getting out of the building, right? We, we cannot sort of sit in our office and just guess. We need to get out there and talk to customers, talk to users, right? And uh, the whole idea here is that we have hypotheses, we design experiments, Especially in the beginning, our experiment has is all basically just called talking to customers, talking to uh, talking to users. Then the test is basically in the beginning. We're just going to see if they have the problem or need. And then the test is if they have the problem or need. The test is is this the the solution that they can use? And then we're going to get insights. We're going to have new hypothesis, and basically the circle continues. Now I want to skip forward a little bit because I've been talking about talking to customers, talking to customers. What does that mean? You know, when we're talking to customers, there's some, uh, well, first of all, it's not for everybody, right? Uh, I think Justin Wilcox, uh, a great educator on lean startup and uh, customer development, calls it a special kind of torture to have to go and speak to uh, random strangers, right? It's definitely not something that everybody is comfortable with, right? Now, um, what do we want to do when we talking about speaking to customers? Well, basically, it's as much face-to-face -face communication as you can get these days. I mean, worst case, it's a video call. Best case, you get uh, a meeting and you can talk to them face-to-face. -face. Um, anyway, the, when we're talking about meeting face-to-face, -face, not doing surveys, mm -hmm. by the way, right? Interviewing is not doing surveys. Why are we not doing surveys? Well, surveys are just basically fixing for an accounting problem. That is to say, you're only going to know what you already put in there. And of course, the emotional component is never going to be transferable through a survey or ma market analysis, right? We want to see when we talk about an issue, if they really have a problem or need, or if they're going to go like, yeah, yeah. You know, if they go like, yeah, but that, 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 then you know that you'd hit a nerve. And we're talking about, if they cannot also start, stop talking about a problem or need, then you know that you hit gold, right? So what we need from the interview subject is about 10 minutes of their time to try to figure out if they are actually having a problem or need, right? Now, it's also important that we talk about the differences in talking to business customers and consumers. It's usually uh, well advised that if you're doing a business model that is targeted towards consumers, that you have to talk to at least 
150 people in the target segments and the customer segments that you think are um, are relevant before you make an opinion about having validated or not your uh, assumption. Why? Well, consumers are a dime a dozen. Everybody has a different taste. Um, when we're talking about business to business, if you're a company selling to another company, then maybe you need to only talk to half of that, maybe even 50, 60 uh, interviews in the same target customer develop, uh, customer segment would be enough because most businesses are the same. That is to say, there is more homo- homogeneity, homo- 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 it's more homogeneous, <laughs> if you will, um, inside a company about which kind of roles have which kind of problem or need uh, as uh, opposed to a consumer. That is to say, when do we know that we have had enough interviews? Well, let's say for a business-to-business business model, you need to have had at least 50 interviews with the customer segments. And with interviews, I mean 10 minutes of FaceTime, of interviewing, of talking to someone. And then in the consumer space, you'd need uh, 120 to 150 interviews before you can make a qualified decision. That is to say, not 10 people <laughs> in, in any case. All right. Now, we need, uh, like I said, 10 minutes. The more you keep it casual, um, the easier it gets um, to get uh, interesting output. And there's actually a wrong reason and a right, re- uh, right, uh, wrong way and a right way to be doing an interview. If you're talking more than 20%, you're doing it wrong. So let's apply the 80 20 rule also to your interviews. Most of the time, you only thing that you should be talking and opening your mouth is either to breathe or to ask a question, not to talk or sell. Because another thing that is super duper important is that we're not trying to interview people to sell them something. We're trying to learn something. We're trying to learn if they have a problem or need. And um, let's take an example um, where you uh, will ask someone uh, and you think that, let's say, let's do the stupid example that I mentioned. Well, I am founding a social network, a Facebook, a Facebook for young dogs, for puppies. And um, I am assuming that this is something that that uh, young puppies have a problem socializing online. And then maybe um, I wouldn't go interviewing puppies because they cannot really tell me anything. So who would I go and interview? Hmm, I would probably go and interview puppy owners. And once I've found a lot of puppy owners, I would be talking to them in a casual way, hopefully for over 10 minutes. And then I will ask them, so, um, so how, how do you currently socialize with your dog? Tell me about your dog. And then a lot of the times, um, they will tell you a little bit. And then you know that, um, sometimes you need to also guide the conversation about, tell me about the last time you, met uh, another puppy with your puppy and so on and so forth, right? You talk, trying to talk uh, as little as possible, but guiding them by asking about things that happened either today or in the past. We do not want to make the customer or user project about the future because this is a big, big mistake I see by first-time founders time and time again. They're asking them, would you use this? Could you see yourself using this? Never, ever ask because you're going to get bullshit answers. You're going to get completely useful, uh, useless answers. People are most likely going to say, well, I could totally see myself using this. The reason why they're saying that is, one, they're really not good at projecting into the future because, I mean, let's face it, we'd all be rich and healthy if we could project into the future. We cannot see the future, right? It's a human condition. We cannot see into the future. Maybe also a laws of physics. But what we can do is to relate to what we have already done in the past, either today or in the past, right? Now, a lot of the time, we're just so desperate. We just want to get some approval. We want to get some people to say, well, I totally want to buy this. But that's not what we're there for. We want to really know if they have a problem or need. And also, when we've gotten to the stage that we know there's a problem, we need, we want to know, is this a solution? 
that they will actually be happy with, we'd be satisfied with, we'd be served by. Not if they would buy it. You would know that they would buy it because they would say, when can I get it? So you know you've struck gold when someone looks in the eye and says, so when can I get it? Right? You do not want to try to sell it. And you don't want to ask people about projecting into the future. You want to be talking to people about what have you done today or in the past that is relevant to the problem or need set that you're trying to test. And that's a big, big mistake I see most uh, first-time founders do all of the time. So only ask, only ask about today or in the past because nobody can actually predict the future. Another way, of course, uh, to get great insights is to play a little bit dumb. Maybe you, you think you understood it, but um, ask them, uh, I, I'm not too sure um, if I understood that correctly. Can you, can you walk me through it? So make sure that people actually uh, explain it properly to you by having them walk you through the problem set. Also, there's something we call um, the currency test, right? Sooner or later, you want to be qualifying if this person actually means business, right? The currency test is one way to validate if what they're saying, what they've been saying and telling you the whole time is actually true. So they want, they have to be able to give you time, reputation, or money to actually qualify if they actually want or if actually have the problem or need, right? So this could be, um, let's say, time. Well, they're already spending time with you uh, doing the interview. They're already spending time with you doing uh, customer development, maybe. So maybe that's validation. They want to actually solve their problem. They're spending time. They're investing time in you. Um, reputation, that means that people are actually sharing about you. They're inviting other people uh, to talk to you. Or money, which is, of course, the, the sort of most honest way of showing demand or, or um, showing you that there's actually a, a validated need, is that they will ask you if they can give you money now to have it. And also, we don't have time to be talking uh, too much about how to do interviews, but there's a great resources out there. There's Rob Fitzpatrick, for instance. Uh, he wrote a book called The Mom Test. It's really uh, recommendable um, to read. Um, it's also, uh, because, uh, most mothers, all mothers, they lie to us because they just want us to be happy. Um, so that's to say the worst kind of feedback you can get about problem or need or your product is of course, from your family, from your colleagues or from your friends, right? Your friends, they just want you to be successful and happy. So they go like, yeah, super cool, super cool. And your family probably wants you to be safe and don't take stupid risks. So they go like, yeah, mm, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. And then uh, your colleagues may have all sorts of reasons about telling you stuff. So what we also need to do, and this is a big, big um, thing, we need to talk to complete random strangers. We need to talk to people we don't know. We don't, uh, want to have the information that we get uh, sort of contained or contaminated by talking to someone who might have a human emotional reason of telling us something. So we also want to prove to ourselves in this process that we're actually the kind of entrepreneur that can get to the kind of people that we think that we need to get to to deliver our uh, product or service, right? So just let me summarize how we talk to customers when we're doing customer interviews is that keep it simple, keep it uh, short. If you ask for five minutes and you've hit a nerve and you, you're really talking about a problem or need that concerns people, you'd be surprised that they cannot stop talking for maybe an hour or less more, right? So ask for a little time and you'll get more if they're really um, if they're really interested in what you're doing. Now, ask for 10 minutes, um, keep it casual. Um, Ask as many questions as you can, but listen most of the time. So if you're speaking, it should only be to ask questions. No selling allowed. And I know this is hard, but we're not trying to pitch our stuff right now. We're trying to learn. You know, you don't see a scientific experimenter going, so will you buy my hypothesis, right? Think about this as a scientific experiment. Selling all of that cool stuff, it's going to come. All of that cool stuff is going to come, but it's going to come later. 
once we have something to sell that the market, we know that the market actually wants, right? And one good way of getting to the bottom of things, um, because we as humans, we usually have a lot of reasons to say what we say, is to use the fa five whys. That is basically to behave like a child, right? Where you go like, so, um, oh, it's raining. Why is it wet? Well, it's raining. Okay. But yeah, it's water. Why? Why is water wet? You know, so you keep on asking and asking and nagging. Uh, and I know you're going to be quite, uh, a lot of you, as, including myself, you're going to be in, uncomfortable asking and nagging. But it's all about not being content with like the first level of answers. Sometimes we need to get really down to the bottom of things. And the fire why comes from the original lean uh, manufacturing process or method methodology, whereas um, I think it was the Toyota factory that had the first human ever killed by a robot. And um, asking why one time wouldn't be very, really helpful because it would just say, well, why did the human die? Why did this person die? Well, a robot killed him. So, so <laughs> why did the robot kill him? Well, because it moved in a way it shouldn't move. And then why did the robot move in a way it shouldn't move? And then basically they asked why, 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 why until they found out, hmm, there was, I think there was a maintenance on a fuse box that hasn't been, hadn't been done properly. So it was like super wide removed from the actual robot where the problem was. So asking why can really get down to the bottom of things. But it is a bit uncomfortable, especially when you're sitting there talking to someone. But don't be afraid to just keep on asking why until you really understand. And the big thing here is also to remember, do only ask about today or in the past. Good help is to walk me through it. Good um, As a good way of learning and understanding is just ask people to walk you through it, how they do things. And like I said, one way of doing a validation of if they really mean business, what they said is the so-called currency test, also very well explained in the book that I just mentioned, is um, can you get them to validate with their time, their money, or their social currency? Okay. So um, I don't know how we are from for time. Let's just check in if we have enough time now to also do the uh, the um, Q and A. Yes, sir. We have enough time to look, to do Q and A. You can find uh, the question in the question panel in the right side of the screen. All right, I see twenty questions already. Cool. There are so much things more that I could be talking about for three days. But this is sort of, if you will, the summary of the things that I find when I talk to thousands of uh, students and entrepreneurs each year that uh, are the important bits that if you get these right, the rest is much easier to follow. So um, let's dwell into the questions, shall we? Yes. Um, should I just pick them uh, myself willy-nilly? Well, you can pick them oh. yourself. Okay, cool. This is cool. So what do you take on initiating startup on developing applications and apps that serve for betterment of society? What would be the common problems and how to face them? Um, that's from uh, Sagar. Now, thank you for that question. Um, my opinion about, um, I mean, I hope that each and every problem uh, or sort of, how can I put it, product or solution will in some way um, better society. Um, I think that one way to not think too much about the, are, is it better, bettering society is that will it provide you with independence? Will you pay more taxes? Will it enable you to have more agency in the world because you have more financial freedom, more, uh, type freedom with your time to apply it to do something that is for the betterment of society. I am not necessarily for or against doing a business in itself that the business is only and only for betterment of society, but I think it, it's combinable. I mean, if, if you're conscientious about society, then um, regardless of what you're doing, use your time and use your money and maybe also depending on what their business is, use the leverage of your business to do something better for society doesn't need to necessarily have to be a business that's founded around something that is for bettering society. 
which is also, of course, cool, but it may be hard to, to run as a successful business. All right. Uh, Avanesh has a question. What could be some ways through which you can approach your potential customers, sir? Well, that is an awesome question. I get it all the time. Now, um, there is a fabulous um, talk by Noah Kagan uh, on the internet. It's called uh, How to uh, Piss Off Developers, I think. Uh, it's basically, it's easier, long story short, it's easier to find people uh, than you thought. Um, we now have digital platforms that makes it easy to reach people around the world. So depending on, on um, your market, or if you're B2B, LinkedIn is one version. Um, before the global pandemic, conferences, business conferences, special groups and interest groups. Um, there are usually also uh, meetups, uh, forums, int groups, all sorts of things that you can use online to find the kind of people that you want to be talking to. Also, uh, hot introductions. If you can find people that know people that you know, so you can get an introduction, that's very helpful. If you cannot get that, um, uh, posing as a student, I see uh, here, um, I don't know if you're a student, but everybody can sort of say that you're a student of life and they're doing some research. Um, you can just reach out to people and you'd be surprised that how many answers if you frame it correctly. If you're addressing a problem or need that they're concerned about, you'd be surprised how many answers. Of course, if you're doing consumer, you just need to st stand in a town square, right? You can just start getting thousands of interviews each day because there's people all around you. Now, let me see. Um, mm -hmm. Alok asks, um, can one really achieve product market fit by applying lean principles for products with long life cycles without any downsides? Uh, okay, I have to think about this one because I really don't understand the question. Uh, all products with long life cycles once started as something else. That's a small little thing, probably, right? So I, I, let's go to the next one. Um, uh, Atharv asks, uh, there always lies a fear that your idea might get stolen if uh, I ask your friends for their opinion about it. What would be the ideal... Uh, what would be the ideal way to get your idea validated in your opinion? So I guess there's there's two uh, ways there. So I, I think it was probably a question that was asked before I said, do not ask your friends <laughs> because we want to have honest and naked opinion and not someone who is socially biased to tell you whatever. Um, and also, I think the biggest question here is, um, should I be afraid of sharing my idea? And here's the thing. if your idea is so fragile, and you all need to hear this. <laughs> if your idea is so fragile that if you share it with a friend that you will not have a business, then that idea was bullshit to begin with. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind will start doing all the hard work on an idea. They will do all the hard work to copy an existing working business, yes, but nobody in their right mind would start copying something that is just an idea. And if they do, by all means, let them, because we already know that 90% of all of them fail. So just let them do that thing and just make sure that you're always one step ahead or one step behind so you can learn from them and don't do their stupid mistakes, right? And also, usually, there's a lot of market space, right? So maybe there's space for even two or three of these kinds of companies. Who knows? Maybe just going to do it differently. And also, you know, if you have a burning vision, if you have a passion about this kind of thing, this idea is something that you really care about. Do you really think that the other person has that passion? I don't think so. Will they actually prevail? I don't think so. Are they going to be giving up because they thought this would be easy? Oh, yes, they will. So do not be afraid of your idea being stolen. Because first of all, you can't steal an idea. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a protectable um, property. Um, second of all, be only afraid of incumbents trying to copy you once, if and only if you're successful. Then yes, be very careful. 
Next question. So here we have, sir, is it wise to build a startup in a domain where you don't have first mover advantage? Now, first mover is bullshit. <laughs> first mover is usually toted as an advantage, but I just like showed you an example where it's even more, uh, con uh, more, um, more um, beneficial to you to be the second mover because you can see what the first mover does wrong. But of course, there are um, benefits of being the first in the space, but usually the risks are much higher. Now think about Facebook. Facebook had the uh, benefit of seven or eight other social networks failing before they were successful. They were not first movers. If you look at history, it's usually not the first movers. Apple wasn't the first mover. There were plenty of others doing the same thing. It's usually that we have this, what we call the uh, survivorship bias. We only see the people who made it because that's how history is written, right? Nobody cares about the 10,000 other companies that failed. So we're looking at the history sort of completely biased. And first mover is usually not an advantage if you look at the facts. Now, here we go. Um, what should entrepreneurs do when their MVP fails? Well, this is great because failing is a part of the MVP, right? The reason why we do a minimal viable product is that we can keep iterating with the learnings. So the failure is not a failure of the MVP. It's a failure of the test. It's a failure of the hypothesis. So the MVP is supposed to fail. <laughs> you done it correctly. I mean, cool. Great. Now move on. You know, what did you learn? Ask yourself, what did we learn of that failure? So usually what you called an MVP was then more likely more a half, half a product, right? Usually when we say it's failed in an MVP state, it's because it wasn't an MVP. It was a bit too much. So what basically an MVP is supposed to be doing is that it allows you to fail every day and then change something because you learned. I mean, the test is supposed to sometimes fail to learn, right? So if an uh, MVP uh, fails, you just keep on iterating, pivot or pers persevere, right? That's the, that's the whole point of an MVP. Um, what are the challenges? Guarv asks here, what are the challenges that comes in execution of a lean startup? Because getting customer feedback on the unfinished product is not always possible. Um, there's so much to unbundle here. How does the lean startup methodology answer such questions? Well, first of all, you should not have a product <laughs> if you don't have customer feedback. That's like what I've been trying to tell you. So um, you can always get customers. If you cannot get potential customers now, you're never going to get them. I mean, just leave it. Don't do a business. You know, you can always find someone if you, if you put in the work, you know, you can always find people to, to give you feedback. As long as you have um, um, uh, access to the internet, you have zero excuse. Um, so how is Lean Startup implemented? I hope that I was able to address some of that. Uh, what is an important characteristic of a future state value stream map that makes it effective? I don't know what that is, so I'm going to skip it. What could be some ways through which you can approach your potential customers? Well, first of all, like I said, the easiest way is just ask your surroundings. So basically, if you're a consumer, if you want to acquire a customer or ask, ask if there's a customer, is, is, is start where you're at. For me, it would be like stepping out here, uh, going like 10 minutes on a bike and stand on the near, nearest marketplace and just see, sort of randomly start talking to people if it was in consumer space. If it would be uh, an online product, maybe also if I had more uh, validation that this is actually a product that the market wants, I could put some mar uh, money into marketing. Um, not a lot, but enough to get me leads, get me uh, their email addresses, maybe schedule meetings online where I can talk to people. So um, you can approach uh, potential customers physically or digitally. And digitally, of course, with the easiest way is to spend money, but it's also, of course, super costly and super risky. So I would talk again about uh, forums. I would talk about maybe you should go to uh, um, all sorts of user groups. Facebook has an amazing amount of user groups that are focused around problems and needs. Um, and there are different kinds of uh, uh, special interest groups all over the place. So there are definitely a lot of, Sources online where you don't have to spend money if you put in the work. 
here we have enjoyed it. Uh, if we need so much customer interaction research, blah, 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 to decide to start a feasibility to continue with it, then how is most of the investors and mentors decided to start a future in five minutes? Well, um, if startups, let's put it like this, if investors were as smart as they think they were, then more than 3% would be actually providing value on a worldwide basis. Usually they're getting paid, or not usually, they're always getting paid if they're not a business angel using your own money, of course, but I'm talking about institutional investors here. And also, um, they're getting paid uh, regardless of what happened, right? <laughs> so most of the times they're wrong. Don't look to them for advice. They don't know what's what. Now, um, sir, what are the biggest obstacles of Lean Startup? Well, one of the biggest obstacles I see is that we, we, um, obstacle is, I wouldn't say it's an obstacle, but one risk is that we think we, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it in the beginning. So I'll, I'll talk about it like from a, from a personal experience. One of the biggest risks with Lean Startup is that you think you're doing it right. And then you sort of start selectively not applying it. <laughs> so you need to have rigor and discipline also in the team where you go as, um, when you say, we're going to do this, we're going to have this feature, we're going to do this. Is that how are we going to test it? What are we trying to test? What are we trying to achieve? Do we have enough data to uh, warrant that we should do this activity, right? So one of the, the risks is that um, you you start um, sort of slipping. You start not applying it because it's hard to keep yourself intellectual honest all the time, but it's what you need. Now, also another thing that I see is that we start... Um, and, and there's a way we can deal with this, but we start like fudging the numbers. It's like we talked to 20 people and now we want to sort of proceed or not. Or we are starting to creatively interpret the input more than we should, right? So it's super important, and I didn't talk about this, but I'll talk about it now, is that it is important when you're doing a test, like good scientific work, to, ap um, to apply a pass-fail criteria before you start the experiment. For instance, if you want to, um, if, if you want to formulate something, let's say if we're just starting out and you believe that a social network for young dogs could be a good thing, then you would have to put yourself in an intellectual honest spot where you define in the beginning how many people you'd talk to and when you'd be satisfied where it's be validated or invalidated that this is a opportunity that you'd proceed with. Because what I see is that often we just sort of forget to do that. And then we sort of go like, yeah, you know, maybe, could be, you know. Um, so you want to make the pass-fail criteria that will say for each test is, we know that we'll be successful if and only if so-and-so happens quantifiably or qualitatively. And we will know that we have not been successful when qualitatively or quantitatively is not really happened. So um, what are the major challenges that come up in execution? No, that was the question. Fun question. Do you think there is any difference between publishing a microbiome research article worldwide and a business startup from scratch? Both got their own risks. Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> uh, if you're in an academic position, you're taking zero personal risk when you're uh, writing, uh, if writing a uh, research paper, right? Um, also, it's usually um, a completely different world, right? So um, what they have in common is usually, uh, hopefully, that they both use the empirical uh, method. They're both using the scientific method, but the amount of risk uh, you're going to be taking is probably going to be immensely different. Um, what are your take on initiating startup on developing application apps that serve a better brand? Yes, we had that one already. Let's see here. Um, here we go. How can you chase investors? Oh, this is a good one. Thank you, Part. Um, how can you chase investors? There's a wrong assumption already in the question. You do not chase them. You make them chase you, right? That you need to switch the the mindset. You need to have something that is so compelling that the investor will chase you. And uh, I have a great resources for you, a resource for you guys. Uh, if you go to venturehacks.com, there's an article about how to raise money without a lead investor, about how to make the investor chase you. Because investors don't chase 
uh, I mean, you shouldn't be chasing investors. It's like um, they will see that you're like one of those uh, lawyer uh, that lawyers that chases ambulances, right? They don't, they don't want to do business with you if you look like you're needy. They don't they don't want to uh, invest in needy companies. They want to invest in in companies that are so cool, so great that they don't have a need to even be talking to that investor, right? Make them chase you, not the other way around. Um, okay, JP says, with lack of investment, how can we hire smart people to work on an idea? Um, how can we hire people without money? Um, without investment, it said. Well, not without money. Well, um, use your own money. It's not always an option. Uh, use money from your customers. Usually a very great option. Don't hire people before you can afford them. <laughs> That's how you do it. So you need to have a product or, or uh, a solution then in the market that is giving you enough revenue that you can actually support um, paying other people to work in that company. I hope that's uh, self-evident, right? You, if you don't have the money coming in from the business, you shouldn't be hiring people. Other than you can show that if you have maybe another salesperson, you can double the sales. Well, then you can do it with, with the money from the customers as well, right? So here we go. How to validate or calculate? Oh, here we go. Um, yeah. How did that? Oh, it. Ah, how we have sorted by upvotes. Okay. Um, time. There we go. Should we calculate the revenue and costing of the subsidiary companies for my parent company in Lean Canvas? If so, should we in manufacturing service this? I don't know. This doesn't sound like a startup to me. If you're doing a daughter company of a main company, you're not a startup. So next question. Um, bum, bum, bum. How can you chase investors? Someone deleted my questions. Yeah, I, I, for me too. I, uh, my questions also suddenly disappeared. Um, how to choose by different ideas from my startup and how to validate to choose an idea? Pranav asks, uh, that's a great question. I hope that I had been able to show you a little bit about how to validate. Um, so um, what is um, uh, choose by ideas, right? Um, I usually uh, think about um, it this way. Um, am I passionate about it? Do I have something special? Uh, do I have a special insight to the problem or need? Um, is it something that I'll be ready to spend six to 10 years on doing? If yes, okay, that's interesting. Maybe I should be doing this instead of something that I'm not so passionate about or don't have the expertise in and also opportunity size, right? So if I'm going to be spending six to 10 years of my life on this, is it a big opportunity? Is it a big market? Are there customers or users that would be paying a lot of money for this? So um, my own expertise uh, all versus uh, market potential and, uh, and my passion about the uh, market or opportunity, that's usually what I use to filter the um, um, question about which idea should I actually tackle next. So the first step of creating a lean startup is, like I said, trying to try to validate or you should validate if, if there's a problem or need, if it's not just a stupid idea, because most ideas are quite stupid to begin with. But over time, you, when you refine it with market input, they get to be really brilliant. Now, how to calculate or validate company valuation at non-revenue generating or pro property prototype stage? Arabas, great question. I get this all of the time. And here's the secret. There is no way in this world to evaluate a non-revenue company. I say it's always a um, product of two factors. How much money you can get is one factor. And the other one is how little of your company can you get away with selling for that a large sum of money. That gives you a product, which is the valuation. So basically is um, whatever the market pays for your company is what it's worth. <laughs> and um, like I said, there's a brilliant article. There's, there's like plenty of very good art articles on venturehacks.com. And one of them talks about how um, actually you can gather momentum and, and also getting uh, other deals or interest from other um from other um investors because the problem is if you're just talking to one investor 
um, you probably are not that attractive because they're noticing that you are needy. So you, what you probably want to have is that you talk to 10, 20, 100 investors because this is a big, big thing. You might be needing to speak to 100 to 300 investors before you get a deal that is sensible, right? But as long as you're not talking to a lot of uh, uh, a lot of other investors and getting feedback and sort of playing them against each other, you're not probably going to have much interest in the round. And the less interest the, in the round, the less they're going to be uh, inclined to give you the kind of deal that you want. And also, here's a big caveat, a big teaching point, if you will. Don't be so fuzzy about the valuation in a uh, pre-revenue uh, uh, phase, right? And pre-revenue, I'm talking about B2B mostly because uh, pre-revenue uh, is not really necessarily the measure, uh, if you will, for an investor if you're doing B2C because we can talk about traction, we can talk about monthly active users, daily active users, engagement metrics that could be insane, that could be worth a lot, right? Doesn't have to have revenue. Um, so basically, it's a um, it's a game where you leverage interest from one actor, one in investor uh, towards the other, and also you use the data, the facts that you have um, to uh, hopefully get a better deal. But don't sweat having a high valuation, right? Just make sure you don't sell out so you lose control. Don't sell out too much uh, percentages of your shares in the first round because you're going to make uh, it impossible for a next round if you're successful for the investor to, to a new investor to come in because there's not enough uh, left for them. And also be aware that if you sell, I don't know if uh, how it is in India with, with um, jurisdictions and legislations, but um, let's say over here in Europe, it's often if you have 24%, 25% sold on the first round of your company, you might already be out of the company because in one or two other rounds, they can put you on the street because you don't have enough voting rights to actually decide anymore over your company. And also, you don't want to have someone maybe in the first round that wants to or is legally able to dictate by veto uh, what you should do or not because this investor may or may not actually know anything about this business, especially because it's a startup that nobody's been doing this before. So there's no reason why they should know anything better. All right. Now, here we go. How would, uh, Hardik says, how one would validate that this is the end of bootstrapping and time for investors? Well, um, hopefully, um, and this is my personal opinion, is that why would you go for an investor uh, instead of keep on bootstrapping? Why would you more, want more problems in selling out? Why would you sell your business to someone else? Um, if there's a good reason for it, then sure. I mean, there are business models that are not really possible to achieve without taking on board investors' money. Like, let's say, a Facebook would never have happened if there weren't investors um, that had invested a lot of money in them because it took a long time before they had solid revenues. Now, um, also, you, you might think that um, bootstrapping, um, I mean, a model like that could could um, probably use at some point uh, some investor money. But you have to ask yourself, um, can I make it on my own? Is it worth giving up control? Um, what is it exactly other than having sort of a little bit more uh, control or predictability or more money in the bank? That the investor is going to um, bring to the table, and I think also that's more important, also in the uh, very important in the in the first round as well. Whereas you should probably be thinking about how much you need to achieve more uh, growth of your intellectual property, to um, achieve more validation, to test things, to make your company more attractive and more valuable. Instead of how much money do I need to for uh, having some sort of um, uh, uh, valuation happening. And also, you should ask yourself, if you're bootstrapping, what if I just go slower and put the money on to the side? Uh, All right. Excuse me? Yes? Audience is buzzing with questions, but there's a time I see, I see. So, I think we should wrap it up now. All right. So, um, is, if you could um, if you could try to is it probably uh, can you capture the questions and yeah, sure. and send them to uh, send them to me in an email 
I will publish answers to all of them with my slides. Sure, sir. I'll send you the questions. Well, thank you. All right. So I think we should wrap it up. And um, with, um, let me see here. Uh, if you go to, um, let me see where we go here. If you go to vidaransen.com, I also do a free open office hours for um, entrepreneurs and students every week. So there's uh, an option on that web page where you can uh, book a time slot. And uh, with that, I would say thank you very much for having me and then really, really great questions. Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful opportunity and for guiding us in the right way. Uh, so I guess it's all for the today. And uh, please don't forget to join tomorrow's workshop on product market fit. So thank you so much. Thank you. Take care thank and I wish you all good luck. Thank you so much.